<clears throat> yeah. So last time we saw that we really need to go to infinity and null infinity of Penrose's sky provides a natural home to describe gravitational radiation. And we saw that in fact, for Maxwell fields in Minkowski space, we get a natural peeling property and the one upon R part of the Maxwell field, which is captured in this field called phi 20. And that phi 20 is called the radiation field. <clears throat> and the Coulombic part is captured in uh, phi 10, which falls like one upon R squared. In, in gravity, we saw that in fact, um, we got uh, the uh, in, in full nonlinear general relativity. We got psi four naught, which falls like one upon r. And last time, a question was asked about why do we call psi four naught radiation field, and why not psi three naught, and so on. And I tried to explain that you know it's a it's psi four naught is a completely freely specifiable data. But more than that, the main point is that psi four naught falls like uh, it falls like one upon r, and psi three naught falls like one upon r squared. And I mean, just by convention, the field which falls like one upon r in for scalar field, Maxwell field, gravitational field is, is called radiation field. But as we'll see today, in fact, the radiative content is contained in something else. I mean, psi three naught, psi four naught, psi three naught, as well as imaginary part of psi three naught. On the other hand, the real part of psi 2 naught and also psi 1 naught have Coulombic information. So that is where we were. And now we would like to do is to discuss about uh, asymptotic symmetries. Now, the reason why we, and we would like to focus on asymptotic symmetries is twofold. First of all, I mean, it's good to know what the symmetries are of a given, of a given uh, physical system. And this is gravitational field of an isolated system. Um, but secondly, these asymptotic symmetries enable us to construct observables, which are of direct physical interest, such as how much energy, momentum, angular momentum, gravitational waves carry away. Uh, and that is why the, there is a very nice, in, in, in physics, there is a very nice interplay between symmetries and uh, the most important physical observables that are associated with them. So the symmetry group is called the body Mesner sachs group. I think most of you have heard about this before. So let me just explain to you the role of symmetries. <clears throat> so as usual, let us begin with a simple example of Minkowski space-time. And in Minkowski space-time, we'll talk about um, uh, a, a, a simp the simplest case, a scalar field. We could also consider a Maxwell field or linearized gravitational field, but let us just consider the scalar field. Now, the symmetry group of Minkowski spacetime is a Poincare group. It is the group of symmetries which preserves the background kinematical structure that we have got. And that is universal in the sense that it is the same no matter what the scalar field phi or the Maxwell field FAB that you may be considering. So these are the dynamical fields and independent of the dynamical fields, they all live in this Minkowski spacetime and we have got this kinematical structure. <clears throat> and then, uh, as I said, it, this is this universal structure is shared by all solutions to the field equations and energy momentum, angular momentum, refer to killing vector fields, which are infinitesimal generators of this Poincare group. Now, in general relativity, space-time varies from one solution of Einstein's equation to another. And a general solution to Einstein's equation has no isometries, has no exact symmetries. But <clears throat> for asymptotically flat space times, sky plus or minus can serve as a universal background or arena to extract physics. And the important thing is that this is some, some structure at sky plus is actually common to all asymptotically flat space times. And that is why it is a kinematical structure it's a universal structure. So what structure do we have? So give me any solution of Einstein's equation, which is asymptotically flat, and let us look at the conformal completion of that. Then the null infinity, either sky plus or sky minus, has topology S2 cross R. <clears throat> and A is a null normal to sky, and we've got a metric QAB of signature uh, zero plus plus, a degenerate metric, 
which is obtained by pulling back the space-time metric to scrub. And this metric and this null normal, as we saw, satisfy that Li n of QAB equal to zero. We saw that last time because in the divergence free gauge, ground A and B itself is equal to zero. And therefore, if I put it back to scry, I just get the equation Li n of QAB equal to zero. And of course, QAB is degenerate and its degenerate direction is of course the null normal itself. So QAB dotted with n equal to zero. <clears throat> so the, the point is that I got scry up here, which is a topology of S2 cross R. And then I got the generators and I can take a quotient of scry by the generators and I'll get two sphere. And basically the fact that QAB and B equal to zero and the N of Q equal to zero means that in fact, QAB is a, um, is a, um, is a, is a pull back to scry of, it is uh, uh, whether this projection mapping and QAB is a pull back to scry of some metric Q bar AB on the base space up here. Um, but we still have a conformal freedom, namely, remember we can, uh, preserving the divergence free gauge, the condition that we have, grad A and B equal to zero at scry, if this condition is still preserved if I make a conformal transformation. So from omega to omega prime, where little omega is, is, uh, is, is smooth and is non-zero at scry, and furthermore satisfies that little omega is lead drag along this, these vector fields Na that omega. So scry is actually equipped with the, with the pairs of the degenerate metric and the normal, whereas where under the conformal rescaling, this rescaling up here, QAB goes to omega squared QAB and NA is, scaled, is rescaled by omega to the minus one times N. So they are proportional to the new QAB and, and B are proportional to the old ones, but the proportionality factors are locked in in, in this particular way. Here I get omega squared and here I get omega to the minus one. So what we're looking for is really this universal structure which is shared by all space times which are asymptotically flat, all asymptotic solutions to Einstein's equation which are asymptotically flat. And that is then a null manifold scribe. So I'm looking at either at scribe plus or scribe minus. And for our purposes, mostly focusing on scribe plus. And I got this pairs where QAB and NA they satisfy these conditions up here and the pairs are equivalent to each other. If QAB is rescaled by omega squared QAB, where omega satisfies this condition, then N should be rescaled by this. Um, so we got uh, the asymptotic symmetry group then, is, is, is called the BMS group and therefore I denote it by B, is the subgroup of the diffeomorphism group on scry here. I got all kinds of diffeomorphisms on scry. So I'm looking at subgroup of all possible diffeomorphisms on scry, which preserves this structure. So of course, if it is a vector field on scry, it will preserve the topology. And then it has to rescale re the metric, map the metric to something which is proportional to itself. So at the infinitesimal level, if you're given a vector field, then lead C of QAB should be proportional to QAB. Let us suppose that lead C of QAB is equal to two phi, phi is a function times QAB. This is a proportionality factor. So this is a finite transformation and this is an infinitesimal transformation under lead C. And then if this is the case, then because of these factors that I got up here at the infinitesimal level, lead C of NA has to be equal to minus phi times N. And of course, just like omega satisfies this, Lee and phi satisfies this condition. So to explain the, explore the structure of the Lie algebra of this BMS group up here, we can first consider the simplest symmetry vector fields. After all, we have a direction field N, which is preferred on scry, which is given to us. So let us suppose that in fact, the symmetry vector field happens to be proportional to N. Let us suppose that it is just some function times N. Then what does it, what does the function have to satisfy in order to qualify as a symmetry? That is to say, so that C satisfies these conditions that I've written down up here. Well, you can easily check that in fact, lead C of QAB, lead C of QAB up here, 
you just expand it out, you get um, function comes out times ln of qab, but ln of qab is equal to zero. That was one of the defining equations up here. And then the second term I get as a contraction of q with n, and therefore that is also zero by this condition up here. Therefore, both terms are zero. So it says that this phi that I got up here must be equal to zero. Therefore, let's see of Na, um, therefore, let's see of Na should be equal to is zero because phi is equal to zero because, well, the, the, the rescaling here and the rescaling here are interlocked. So if this is zero, then this must be zero. And then you expand this out and that just immediately tells you that um, ln of f equal to zero. So f is also satisfies, f is also a function of, a priori it could be a function of u theta phi, but it has no u dependence, it only depends on theta and phi. It is constant, this function f is constant along the integral curves up here. It's a pullback uh, around this pi of some function f bar on the base space that I got up here. So there, there's some function f bar here and I pull it back and I get f and that is our symmetry vector field. So C equal to F times Na is a symmetry vector field if and only if F satisfies this condition. So if this, that is to say, if the symmetry is a vertical vector field, if it is, if it is uh, parallel to N, so N is a vertical direction, then Lien of F is equal to zero. And these symmetries are called super translations. And I'll just denote it by S up here. So obviously, since f is a function of theta and pi, I got infinitely many generators of this symmetry group, and they, they, they commute. It is an exercise. Everything in purple here is exercise. Here, purple is exercise. So please do that. Please check that. So you can easily check that they actually commute. So it's an abelian Lie algebra here. But furthermore, supposing you give me any symmetry whatsoever, completely general symmetry, uh, then, uh, then we see that for a completely general symmetry, what you satisfy is that lead C of QAB equal to 2 pi QAB and lead C of N should be equal to minus 5 times N. So in particular, lead C of N should be equal to minus 5 times N. And so we can just take um, a super translation and a generic symmetry vector field. And we can take the commutator between the generic vector field and super translation. And again, as an exercise, you can check that what I get is again proportional to n. And whatever I got up here is actually again D derived by, 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 by n. So this is again a super translation. So what we see is that the commutator of a general vector field, a symmetry vector field with a super translation is a super translation which means that super translations form a Lie ideal. When this is just the definition of the Lie ideal, that the, quality, the Lie bracket between a vector, between a general vector field, general element of the Lie algebra and super translation is again a super translation. Um, so therefore, in fact, what we can do is we can take the BMS Lie algebra and we can take its quotient and we want to know what is its quotient. So let us suppose we take a general element of the BMS vector field. And now what this says up here is the following, that as I go up the generator, up and A up here, if, if like I can just rewrite this equation as Lie n of C is equal, to minus, is equal to plus five times n. So if I go up and down, then, uh, then C changes, but C changes proportional to the vertical direction NA. And therefore, if I take this vector field and project it, or if I take this vector field and project it, the difference between them is a vertical vector field. So the projection of the vertical vector field is zero. Therefore, the projection of this vector field and this vector field and the vector field up here is all the same. So the vector field C can be projected unambiguously on this vector on, on the base space of the two sphere. And let us call it C bar up here. So then so we already taken care of uh, or use the, the, fir the first equation, namely our second equation, lead C of n, uh, lead C of n is equal to minus five times n. That tells us that C can be projected down. And now we can use the second equation. And the second equation just says that in fact, 
the lead C of QAB is equal to two phi times QAB. That just implies that when I project it down, since Q is a lift of Q bar and C bar is a projection of C, it follows that lead C of Q bar is equal to some function of phi bar up here times QAB, which means that I got a metric on this two sphere, Q bar AB, and C bar is a conformal killing vector field of that metric. Now, it just is a fact, mathematical fact, that the Lie algebra of conformal killing vector fields of a two sphere is isomorphic, is six dimensional, and it is isomorphic to the Lorenz Lie algebra uh, in four dimensions. So, two sphere and four, four space time dimensions. So, <clears throat> therefore, if I take now, so what I've done up here is I've taken this general vector field C and I project it down. And I get C bar and C bar are conformal killing vector fields. And their Lie algebra is a Lorentz Lie algebra. That tells me that if I take the BMS Lie algebra and quotient it by the super translations, then I just get the Lorentz Lie algebra, which is generated by this projected vector fields, C bar. Or at the group level, the BMS group is a semi-direct product of the super translations, which is the abelian group by Lorentz subgroup. It is a normal abelian subgroup by the Lorentz group. And I got here, uh, if I take the quotient, then I just get, so if I take the quotient, then I get just the Lorentz group up here. That is the same statement as here. And so this structure that I got up here is exactly the same as the structure of the Poincare group. The Poincare group also admits a normal abelian subgroup, and that is a translations. And the quotient is a Lorentz group. So Poincaré group is also a semi-direct product of the translations with the Lorentz group. The difference is that here, the translations are replaced by super translations. This is a four-dimensional group, and this is an infinite-dimensional group. And that is a key difference up here. So at first, this came as a big surprise that the group is not the Poincaré group, even though we're talking about asymptotically flat space times, na naively you would have thought that the asymptotically, asymptotic symmetric group would be the Poincaré group, but it's not. But it's in fact an infinite dimensional generalization of the Poincaré group. And how does this happen? How is it that even though we're talking about asymptotically flat space times, the group is not the Poincaré group? Well, let me give you the heuristics here. here. Namely, what roughly, when we say we've got a physical metric, which is asymptotically flat, we mean it um, approaches a Minkowski metric plus one upon R times remainder term, where R is defined by the Minkowski metric. So what we mean is that I can, given the physical metric, there exists a Minkowski metric, and I can look at the Cartesian chart of this Minkowski metric, any one of the Cartesian charts, and the components of the physical metric in the Cartesian chart defined by the Minkowski metric are such that they, be, they look like the components of G in that chart is equal to components of eta in that chart, which is always minus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus the remainder term one upon R. Now, supposing G tilde approaches one flat metric eta tilde AB. In this precise, in the precise sense, and now suppose I just make a simple transformation, which is like a translation, but it is an angle-dependent translation. T goes to T prime is equal to T plus f of T times phi. Then I can, with the new T prime, I can construct another flat metric eta prime AB, and then uh, whose Cartesian coordinates are T prime x, y, and z. So eta eta prime um, is of eta tilde prime is obtained from eta tilde by an angle dependent translation. Now you can check that if in fact I got G tilde AB such that its components in the Cartesian chart defined by eta tilde AB behave like they fall up like one upon R, then you can check that its components in the Cartesian chart defined by it. By, by eta prime, namely t prime x, y, z, also behave like the components in the new chart 
also behave like the Minkowski metric in the new chart plus term of the order of 1 upon R with respect to the new chart. So the physical G tilde IAB also approaches eta tilde IAB. And this is an important exercise and I urge you to do it. So the statement is that when we say that G tilde IAB approaches a Minkowski metric, this Minkowski metric is not unique. Given one of them, I can define another one, which is defined, which is related to the first one by an angle dependent translation. You see, if I just make a translation, if this were a constant, then of course the two Minkowski met metrics are the same. But with the angle dependent uh, translation, eta tilde prime AB is not equal to eta tilde AB. I get two different metrics. <laughs> and so now, since you know, I got a, this Minkowski metric at infinity, this Minkowski metric at infinity, and the physical metric approaches both of them as one upon R and one upon R prime. So they are both admissible. So the symmetry group could be Poincaré group of this metric as well as Poincaré group of this metric. But these Poincaré groups are different just because <clears throat> the two metrics are different. <clears throat> And therefore, the statement is that given the physical metric, I don't have a preferred eta, eta tilde AB. I can have eta tilde AB, eta tilde prime AB, eta tilde double prime AB, etc., all related by angle dependent translations. So I can take the Poincare group of this, I can get the Poincare group, group of this, of Poincare group of eta tilde double prime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of these Poincare groups would be equally admissible as a symmetry group. And roughly speaking, intuitively, the BMS group can be thought of as being the obtained by gluing together all P prime, P prime, etc., P, P prime, P double prime, etc., and inconsistently. And that is why we get infinite dimensions because of this angle dependency of um, translations that I have done in, go, in going from eta to eta tilde, eta tilde to eta tilde prime. P. So at the Poincare group, the BMS group is a symmetry group of general relativity tailored to asymptotic flatness at the infinity. And therefore, it is very useful for radiation, gravitational waves, electromagnetic waves, neutrinos, etc. This enlargement came to be appreciated by particle physics uh, and, and perturbative treatments of classical and quantum gravity only over the last decade. Conceptually, a key effect, this is the key effect of uh, uh, nonlinear general relativity that in presence of gravitational waves, <clears throat> the symmetry group is no longer a Poincaré group, but is in fact <clears throat> necessarily an infinite dimensional generalization thereof called the BMS group. Let me just tell you interesting anecdotes since you are all sitting in Warsaw. Um, in the 62 or 63 conference in Warsaw, I forget that, I think 63 conference in Warsaw, this is a very, very famous conference, and I urge all of you to look at the proceedings because all the discussions were taped in that conference. And there was a lot of discussion about reality of gravitational waves and so on. And Feynman was there, and even Feynman did not quite understand this whole business about enlargement of the Poincaré group to the BMS group. Coming from particle physics, one always just says, well, the physical metric is equal to GAB plus GAB is equal to eta AB plus some one upon R terms. And I got eta AB. What do you mean I got inequivalent eta ABs? That, doesn't, that didn't make sense to them because they start out with the eta AB, which is given to you. But in general relativity, we don't have an eta AB. All we have is a, is a curve metric GAB, and we have to extract eta AB. And there is no canonical eta AB, but we got a whole bunch of eta ABs which are related to each other by angle dependent translations and they are all equally good especially in presence of gravitational waves uh, we cannot really take one versus the other and that is why we get this enlargement of the bms group and this is not something that was realized by particle physicists until about 10 years ago so interestingly although i got in, in the infinite although the super translations are, is an infinite dimensional uh, uh, lease of algebra of the BMS group. Interestingly, it still admits a four-dimensional normal subgroup. In fact, there's a unique four-dimensional normal subgroup of the BMS group. This is a very beautiful paper by Ray Sachs, which shows this. 
So it's a unique four-dimensional normal subgroup, uh, and that is called the group of translations. And in Minkowski space, the uh, this group of this group, of course, is the isometric group. In other words, if I complete Minkowski space with scry, and if I take the killing vector fields inside the Minkowski space, then asymptotically they become asymptotic symmetry groups, elements of the BMS group, and they are, of course, subgroup of translations, but a specific subgroup of translations T up here. But the more important thing is that even if I don't have Minkowski space, in other words, all these different Minkowski spaces I talked about, eta AB, eta tilde AB, uh, sorry, eta tilde AB, eta tilde prime AB, eta tilde double prime AB, all of them, then these Minkowski matrix are different from each other, but their translation groups are exactly the same. And you can also check that when you do this exercise, you will see that in fact, it is the case that D by DT, D by DX, D by DY, the translation group that I get, I get in all these things is exactly the same. So this is the same because you, you go out all the way to infinity. And now, how do I specify what the translations are? Well, this is not essential, but as I mentioned, sometimes it is e easy to go to the bond conformal frame. Oops. It, sometimes it is easier to go to the bond conformal frame in which the unit, the, the two the metric at SCLA is a unit two sphere metric, not a, any old metric on a two sphere, but in fact a unit two sphere metric. Then if I consider linear combinations of the first four spherical harmonics, alpha naught, and uh, which is a constant, so if you like multiple of y0, 0, and y1 m's defined by this unit two sphere metric, then those particular uh, super translations, so where the function, if you like, uh, instead of f of theta phi, which is a general function, if in fact it is a linear combination of the first four spherical harmonics, then, um, th then those, <clears throat> they correspond to super translations. Of course, people who are more mathematically minded immediately would say, ah, but I got a three parameter family of unit two sphere metrics on the on the on the two sphere. What happens if I change them? Well, it turns out that of course the individual descriptors alpha change, but in fact the first the subspace spanned by the first four spherical harmonics with respect to a unit two sphere metric QAB or a Q prime AB, which is also unit two sphere metrics, is the same. So it is does this the subspace does not depend on the choice of the uh, of the metric so long as the metric is in a bond conformal frame, that is to say a unit two sphere metric. And the notion of energy momentum is tied with this translation group and that of super, super momentum is tied with the group of super translations up here. <clears throat> and these are completely well-defined. Right? I mean, they're that, that that just generalizations, obvious generalizations of what we know in Minkowski space for energy momentum um, of um, uh, Maxwell field or scalar field. But now, because the quotient of the BMS group by, uh, by, by super translations is, uh, is, 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 there's a Lorentz transformation, but to get the Lorentz group, I have to actually take the quotient by super translations. Whereas for Poincare group, I only have to take quotient by translations. Therefore, the Poincare group has a four parameter family of Lorentz subgroups, whereas the BMS group has infinitely many Lorentz subgroups. And angular momentum refers to these Lorentz subgroups. So in, in, in Poincare case, we got a four dimensional ambiguity of notion of angular momentum. And that is just because I can define angular momentum about one uh, uh, origin or another origin, and then I got a standard transformation properties. So I got, it's just a choice of origin in Minkowski space. That is the ambiguity up here. But now we've got infinite dimensional ambiguity, which is not so easy to understand in space-time terms. And that is the ambiguity, which is called as a super translation ambiguity in the defini definition of angular momentum. To summarize, the BMS group has an interesting structure. It mirrors what happens in Minkowski space, Poincare group, but translations are extended to super translations. So asymptotic flatness of scry is needed for gravitational waves in full general relativity. The asymptotic symmetry group is B. It preserves the universal structure of scry, 
that is common to all asymptotically flat space times. I just worked at Scry and derived what the BMS group is, but you can also look at the full physical space time and look at the diffeomorphism group of the, the physical space time that preserves the asymptotically flat boundary conditions. And I can take the quotient by the subgroup of diffeomorphisms that, that are asymptotically identity. They don't do anything at all at infinity. The quotient is the same as this BMS group. So there are two descriptions. We, we, I discussed the more intrinsic one in the, in the lecture just now. And the BMS group is a semi-direct product and S is an infinite dimensional it's normal subgroup of two super translations. And it is generated by vector fields which are vertical up here. <clears throat> Now, if I make a conformal transformation, then N changes by this formula, and therefore F also changes by omega times F because the symmetry vector field does not change. So F is not a function, but F is a conformally weighted function. It has a conformal weight one. And this is often forgotten in some perturbative treatments or in particle physics treatments, and they treat F as just functions, and that can lead to conceptually misleading results. So F is a conformally weighted function. But the super translation subgroup still admits a canonical translation subgroup, which in a bondy conformal frame is given by the first four spherical harmonics. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and that is that is where we are. So now we can talk about bondy momentum and super momentum. And we can also talk about angular momentum. But if I had one more lecture, I could have done angular momentum, but I don't have enough time. So therefore I'm going to Focus just on the four momentum and super momentum. I would be happy to answer questions about angular momentum if there are any. And now what we can do is the following. As I mentioned before, if you have symmetries, then there are corresponding charges and fluxes that you can define. In Minkowski space, if you give me the time translation, then I got the notion of energy. If I got space translation, then I can use it to define the three momentum of the Maxwell field or the scalar field or particles. So similarly here, I got the BMS translations. They define a four momentum and BMS super, trans and super translations, they define super momentum. But now I got two different notions at infinity. The notion of charges. That is to say, if you give me a cross section of scry, u equal to u naught, then what is the energy or what is the momentum or the angular momentum of the system at that retarded instant of time? So here I got some system which is radiating away. And I just asked, well, it has been radiating away for a while. So at this retarded instant of time, u is equal to u naught. How much is the energy that is, radi that is left over? So it has been radiating away. I got a lot of energy here. At this retarded instant of time, u equal to u naught. Um, the total energy that is left or left over, roughly speaking, after allowing for radiation that has gone through. So that is called the charge because it is a two-sphere integral. But we also have fluxes. The fluxes are three-sphere integrals, uh, sorry, in three-dimensional uh, integrals across open regions of sky like that. How much energy, angular momentum, momentum is radiated away through some region of sky like that, and that is called corresponds to fluxes. And then we got balance laws, which relate the, the, the charge at this instant of time, charge at this instant of time, and the flux that is in between. Namely, charge here is equal to charge here minus whatever flux went out at infinity over there. <clears throat> so that is what I'm going to now explain. But first, let's say, how, how are we going to do this? So in Maxwell theory, in Minkowski space-time, we got a notion of energy momentum. And as we saw before, we can take the stationary tensor, I can take any killing vector field, and I can do an integral on t equal to constant surface, and I can take the t equal to a larger and larger values of t, and ultimately arrive at scry up here. And if I take this, this limit, then I get an integral at infinity, which is given by alpha times phi two naught squared times du. We saw that in the very first lecture. Now for gravity, fortunately now we have the, the killing vector fields, which are given by alpha times Na, this is the same alpha that we got up here. So we know what the vector field is here on Scry, which is alpha times Na. But unfortunately, we don't have a, a gauge invariant notion 
of the stressory tensor. There is no stressory tensor for the gravitational field itself. And therefore, I cannot really perform this integral to obtain what the flux is. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is that for Maxwell theory, we can obtain the same expression of energy, momentum, angular momentum that we obtained starting with the killing vector field. We can obtain the same expression using Hamiltonian methods. Namely, this integral that I wrote down is in fact the Hamiltonian on the phase space of Maxwell fields, which generates the infinitesimal canonical transformation corresponding to the symmetry you gave me. So if you give me a killing vector field, if you give me a solution of Maxwell's equation FAB, then lead derivative by the killing vector field of FAB is again a solution of Maxwell's equation. So this is an exercise that you can check that, 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 that this is a fact. And this is true also for Klein Gordon fields or um, and, and, um, te and any test fields that we got in the Minkowski space. So, so in this procedure, if you have the Hamiltonian structure, which means that if I were, if you can introduce a, a symplectic structure on the phase space of Maxwell fields, and for those of you who know, you can construct a covariant phase space out of the, just the solutions of Maxwell field. And on that covariant phase space, you've got this nice transformation. For those who are canonic, used to canonical uh, phase space, you can just take Minkowski space time and you can just decompose it by t equal to constant slice, t equal to t naught slices up here in Minkowski space time. And when you have done that, you can just give an FAB, you can get E and B uh, uh, vector fields up here, and you've got a sim symplectic structure on that. And then if you give, give me any killing vector field, that given the FAB, it gives me leaky FAB. So I get a new Maxwell field and I can calculate its E and B and that is a canonical transformation and you can calculate what the Hamiltonian of that is. And that is precisely the quantity that we got up here. So there's a very nice idea, namely that we don't need the stress area tensor. We can just use the Hamiltonian framework. And in my view, there's also a deeper idea because in a certain well-defined sense, the symplectic structure or the Hamiltonian framework can be regarded as an imprint that is left on the classical physics by quantum physics. There is no H bar, but there is still a symplectic structure. And that is kind of the information that is left by quantum theory on classical theory. Now, interestingly, we can repeat this procedure in full general relativity. We can construct, um, we can construct Hamiltonians in the same way at spatial infinity, this leads to the Arnovit there's a Misner expressions for energy momentum or, and the, or the total four momentum of space time, which includes sources and radiation. We can do the same thing at null infinity, which is less well known. And in fact, the phase space and the symplectic structure was obtained, you know, already 40 years ago. And the BMS Hamiltonians were also obtained or this, this around the same time. So, the statement is that we can really define, use asymptotic symmetries and really define the fluxes and charges associated with asymptotic symmetries. And this is a very beautiful mathematical structure associated with the geometry at scry that leads to the phase space of radiative phase space, degrees of freedom. And that is very similar to that of Maxwell and Young-Mills theory. So all fundamental forces of nature <clears throat> that are described by gauge theory, namely electroweak interaction and strong interactions described by Young-Mills theory <clears throat> and uh, gravitational interaction defined by general relativity. In all of these cases, <clears throat> there is in fact a nice radiative phase space at null infinity that can be used <clears throat> to define these charges and fluxes. And that also serves as the uh, starting step, the first step towards quantization of radiative degrees of freedom of full nonlinear general relativity as well as Yang-Mills theory. So that is us in the last, last part of this talk. <clears throat> Let me tell you the main ideas up here. <clears throat> the main idea is the following. For any asymptotically flat solution G tilde IB of Einstein's equation, 
The conformal completion gives us scry with a metric QAB, intrinsic metric QAB, and null normal QA. Anyway. And this is a universal structure. This is common to all space time, as we just saw. This, so to say, the zeroth order structure just obtained from the metric and the simple and the conformal factor. And that is common to all asymptotically flat space time. But we also have the derivative operator of the metric. And the derivative operator <clears throat> is like a connection for the Maxwell theory or Young Mills theory up here. And it's a non trivial fact that. Because we got this, this nice uh, divergence free frame, because grad A and B is equal to zero at scratch, because of that, this grad that I got here actually induces an unambiguous derivative operator on scratch. So this grad induces a torsion free derivative operator on intrinsically defined on scratch. So you are all used to this, namely that if you give me a space time, and if you give me, for example, um, a space-like surface in a given space-time, so t equal to constant or t equal to t0, for example, surface, then, of course, the space-time graph induces on this uh, derivative operator d. That is because the space-time gab gives me a metric here, hab, and this d just annihilates that metric hab up here. <clears throat> but at scry, the metric is degenerate. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, at Scry, the metric is degenerate. And because the metric is degenerate, there are many, many derivative operators which kill this metric. But the space-time derivative operator, sorry, I should write here, the space-time derivative operator, grad A I got here, induces a unique D on Scry. So it picks a particular derivative operator on Scry. Of course, that derivative operator kills grad A of D of N B uh, Q A B equal to zero. And it also kills N, the reason is because we know that grad A of NB is equal to zero. And therefore, it, it implies that this is also equal to zero. So these properties you would have expected because you've got this universal structure. But the point is that there are many derivative operators which satisfy these conditions because QAB is, is degenerate. But the space-time graph selects for you a unique D. <clears throat> and it turns out that this D carries precisely the radiative information in the nonlinear gravitational field. To me, this is almost a miracle that this is the case, that it carries exactly the radiative information. And this is also true for Young-Mills theory. So in all basic forces of nature, which like, you know, the, which carry the, uh, the propagate, propagation, uh, which, which carry the degrees of freedom, if you like, like the Maxwell theory and Young-Mills theory, and and uh, <clears throat> which mediate forces between 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 uh, uh, particles. For all of them, it is the case that in fact there is a the derivative operator at scry captures the radiative information. Now we don't have enough time for me to actually show this in detail, so I give you your references, and I'm just going to tell you the idea, and then we'll stop. I think we should stop just in a yeah, just in a minute up here. <clears throat> Namely, the new information in D, now because it is radiative information, it varies from space, one solution to another. This information is universal. No matter what solution you give me, I get this information. But the D is not universal. The, what is the content of this D? How do you do that? How do you find this D? So of course, D kills QAB. Now, as we saw before, QAB, it just, so we got this projection operator pi, and QAB up here is just the pullback of Q bar, Q bar AB up here. And of course, on the base space, I have a derivative operator D bar. <clears throat> so supposing you give me um, a horizontal vector field, a horizontal one form, sorry. So you give me a one form H bar AB here, and I can put it back. Then I will get a one form which is transverse to N, and is a what is a vertic vertical direction and is lead the lead drag by it. Not very surprisingly, since D A F Q B C is equal to zero, the action of D on these horizontal forms is completely determined by 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 Q. In other words, all derivative operators D that I got on scratch, they will actually have the same action on the horizontal edge. 
So what is left? What is left is the, so the horizontal, if you like horizontal ones are like D by D theta here and D by D phi, or horizontal ones are like D theta and D phi. These are the horizontal one forms which are lifted from here. But there's another one form, which is DA of U. So if I look at U equal to constant sections up here, so, and you just set U equal to U naught, and then you can actually obtain uh, uh, lead rack U by this, this equation. Then you'll obtain one parent family of cross sections up here, U equal to constant, and we're going to covariate normal to them. And this covariant normal is not horizontal because clearly an A times LA times NA is equal to minus one. It's not equal to zero. It's not. And the extra information in D is just what it does to these non-horizontal one forms. So new information in G is really what it does to these non-horizontal one forms. And that is really captured in this trace-free part of the derivative operator and these Q's are just projections into these two spheres up here. So the new information in D, I'm not proving this in detail, it's intuitively clear to you, I hope, but it is true in detail and the references I gave you show it, that the new information in D is precisely captured by shear up here. And this shear varies from space-time to space-time. Namely, shear has these two independent components and these are transverse trace-free uh, degrees of freedom of gravitational field. They are the waveforms up here. Or in the physical space time, they go like R upon two times HTT. And the information in D that is not universal or that is not kin kinematical, there's a part of the information in D which is universal, which is what it does to these horizontal one forms. But what it does to L is not universal. One space time, like Schwarzschild space time, will do something to it. And the radiating space time will do something completely different to it. In Schwarzschild space time, you can choose these d, u equal to u naught cross sections so that this is identically equal to zero. In a radiating space time, you cannot choose this equal to zero on the on all of these cross sections. And so you like got you will have uh, no the the notion of radiation is actually encoded here. But as we saw here, to get sigma, we had to use cross sections, we had to use l, etc. Whereas to define d. I did not need to use any extra structure. So D captures the radiative, radiative information of, in the, in the, of the nonlinear gravitational field, the two degrees of freedom in the nonlinear gravitational field in an coordinate invariant, in an extra structure invariant, in an intrinsic manner. It is only when to make contact with the literature, with the standard thing that people do, that we have to use L or we have to use Hs and so on and so on. And the radiative phase space is just obtained. It's just the space of all these D on scry, which are compatible with N and QAB. And it turns out that it is on this radiative phase space that there is actually a symplectic structure. And on that radiative phase space, as I'll explain in the next, next lecture, we can define the Hamiltonian sun fluxes. Okay, so let me stop here. And I can take some questions if there are. <clears throat> Is there anybody, so somebody should speak up and ask uh, Yurek or Adam or somebody should speak up? Uh, so you told that the in the last 10 years, people in particle physics community realized about this BMS group, this extension of concave group. And I was wondering, is there some phenomenology connected with that? Or is this conceptual, like, uh, improvement in our understanding, but does it carry something? So Poincaré group is basically something fundamental to how we form our interaction, like even writing down the Lagrangians in quantum field theory. So did this BMS revolution somehow impact particular physics in particular? I'm, I'm just curious. Very good, very good, nice question. So the answer is yes, uh, but namely, the these are the fields that we're talking about at sky they refer to the zero rest mass fields right they are the ones which get registered at sky um so 
the these associated with the zero response fields that are infrared problems that were kind of ignored for the longest time. But now there is much more interest in these infrared problems. And the, um, the origin of this infrared problem is really intimately associated with the extension of the Poincare group to the BMS group. Uh, you're right that for particle physics, normally we just look at the Poincare group because we worked in, in, in particle physics, one just works in Minkowski space. In Minkowski space, in a given Minkowski space, there is of course a Poincare group. And representational Poincare group are used to talk about, for example, masses and spins of particles and so on and so forth. That has not changed. In the early days, there was a hope in the, in the 60s and 70s, in the 70s, there was a hope that maybe we have to look at the representation of the BMS group and you might get new particles or new somethings which will be associated with the representation of the BMS group as opposed to the point group. That has not at all materialized. So the importance of, <clears throat> of the extension is really about, um, uh, it's, it's only when you bring in gravity and uh, and, but it, 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 it has a shadow also for Maxwell theory and Young Mills theory. And these shadows are all have to do with, um, uh, with, the, with the infrared problems. So it really has to do with the infrared issues. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question my, myself. Uh, so uh, by uh, these days, people in celestial holography consider also super rotations. So what, what do you think about this extension of BMS? Wait. So th there are two th there are two issues about it. First is one can just look at an extension of the BMS group, which includes as uh, your except super rotations. So that corresponds to replacing the Lorentz group that we had with the group of diffeomorphisms or Area preserving. Oops, where is it? Uh, it's somewhere. Yeah, the 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 Lorentz group that we have got up here by the either diffeomorphisms of the two sphere or area preserving diffeomorphisms of the two sphere, and so these are super rotations or you know these are more more general than the Lorentz group up here. So the first question you would like to ask is the following: that are these Symmetries, really symmetries of space times. In other words, is it the case that somehow people who did not consider super rotations just ignored some isolated, in physically interesting isolated gravitational fields, uh, or which are more general, for which the group is more general? So let me start from scratch again. If you impose boundary conditions which are weaker, then the group of asymptotic symmetries becomes larger. So the question is whether Bondi, Mesner, Sachs, Penrose, and so on introduce boundary conditions which exclude, which are too stringent, and which exclude some physically interesting situations. And to accommodate the physically interesting situations, we have to enlarge. The, the sorry, we have to weaken the boundary conditions and enlarge the group. And I don't see anything. I asked all these people repeatedly, what is it that physically one is missing? What isolated physically, uh, physical isolated systems are we missing that are not encom encompassed by the BMS group? And the answer is, I don't get any answer. I don't see that we're missing anything at all. So I don't think that the boundary conditions that were given by Bondi, Mesner, Sachs have to be weakened. They are perfectly fine as it is. So it really is a case that the asymptotic symmetry group by itself is a BMS group. But there's a second question one can ask. For example, in the Hamiltonian framework, one can ask the question that you can have symmetries which are not symmetries which are given by, uh, sorry, in the Hamiltonian framework, you can have symmetries which don't come from space time. For example, in the central potential problems, we have got the rung lens vector, which is a symmetry, but that doesn't come from rotations or translations or any Euclidean killing vector fields. It's a phase space symmetry, 
And it's a very powerful one. And so to me, super rotations are like that. Super rotations are interesting observables uh, or super momenta, super rotational momenta, if you like, the, the, the charges they define are interesting physical observables. They arise in the phase space framework, but they don't have a space time interpretation. They are more like a rung, lens lung, rung vector for the Coulomb problem than the trans, translations or uh, rotations in the Coulomb problem. So at the Hamiltonian le level, the total energy and the angular momentum and the lens, uh, the lens vector uh, are all on the same footing. And so similarly here at the Hamiltonian level, I think that the quantities correspond to super translations. They give, the interest, they give interesting uh, canonical transformations. They are generators. You can you know, study them. And that is interesting to get physical observables. But they are not asymptotic symmetries of space time. Maybe uh, we should for a few minutes, like five minutes, and then start. Oh, maybe even 10 minutes. There is like two more if, questions. If I don't know. Oh, there are more questions? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, OK. <laughs> All right. can, can we ask more questions? Of course, you can ask more questions. We can just then. Um, OK. So I have two, two questions regarding conformal frames. Yeah. Uh, so the first one um, uh, has to do with, with the subgroup of translations. You you showed to us how to um, identify this subgroup of, of translations by fixing first a bondi frame. But um, I thought one can do that uh, without fixing the frame using this, Absolutely. this row tensor of Kerok or yeah, something. Exactly, exactly. So, so and, yeah, I, I would like to, 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 to ask you to, to comment on that. And the second question is, uh, so I guess the beauty of of this uh, phase space um, uh, at at the sky is this conformal invariance or okay or catching variance, but but at the end one is using this divergence free uh, family of cages. So I would like to ask you what happens to the zero order structure that you define um, and to this. Uh, space of connections that you have if one does not pick a divergence-free gauge? Thank you. Very, very good questions. Okay, so the, I, I, I wish I remember exactly the answer to the first question, but it's something like, you know, um, in the, in the garrosh roy B tensor, it is, um, I, I'll look it up again in the, in the break if you like, but it is something like um, uh, if I take Yeah, just, just one second. Um, is it DFCB? Yeah, it is something like DFCB. L let me not try it. I, I, because I, I'll tell you, there, there's a simple formula in terms of rho B tensor, which tells you how to characterize the translations. Okay. I, I just might make a mistake and there's no point in wasting my time, wasting your time and my time in doing that. But there is a simple formula. Um, so now the the nice question you ask is about, well, what happened in the divergence free frame, right? So here the statement is basically that I can always, there's no loss of generality. It's not that I, you know, um, I, 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 re I removed some part of the, of the allowed um, gravitational fields by going to divergence free frame. There is still a conformal freedom that is left over, right? Um, and, and then what we did was to, in other words, in the very in the very beginning, but maybe I should just do this. Okay. So the the point is that in the very beginning we got this the the, the physical metric, G A B G tilde I B, and we define omega squared times G A B G tilde I B to be equal to G A B, and I have got this conformal freedom which is omega goes to in general, omega times uh, times little omega. And then the, then G A B will go to G prime A B. So if I were to what we achieved by asking the divergence free frame, grad A and B equal to zero, which then This then 
told us that grad A and B was equal to zero. So what we achieved in doing this is really we, res we restricted our omega by to, to satisfy the condition Li omega is equal to Li and omega is equal to uh, uh, zero, right? If I had not put this condition, so if I had not put this condition, then little omega would be completely would be completely arbitrary. So then in that case, I would just have to say that I got QAB and A is going to be equal to Q prime AB equal to omega squared of QAB and N prime A will be equal to omega to the minus one and A, where this omega is arbitrary. The group I'll get would be the same as the BMS group. It's just that the, the equations are longer. What we did was to conveniently gauge fixed partly the conformal freedom in order to simplify the calculations. But if I had not simplified the calculations, I, if, I, if, sorry, if, I, if I had not chosen this gauge, then I would still get just all I got is cry. I don't have I zero and I plus, no other structure. Then the statement, the, the group that I would get is still the BMS group. But I will answer your question. I'll just look up the correct formula for how to characterize the translations in the, uh, without going to the bonding gauge. Okay, there was a second question, I think, right? Another person wanted to ask questions. So maybe later. <laughs> yes, yes. So so now let us uh, take a break, a 10 minute break. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, the people are coming in, so in like a minute you can start uh, the lecture. Okay, so I think we can start. Okay. Okay, so you can see my slides and can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened here, but let me try again. Um, because uh, there's a way of something just, my, my whole setting changes now after I started. Um, yeah. I, don't seem to have a ah, maybe here. I ah, good, good. So, yeah. So the question that I that I'll just asked me is about the the BMS translations. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the numerical factors right. Uh, but the basically the idea is that so the question was. Hmm, it's really weird that there. All my settings just changed in one second ago. <laughs> I don't know why they changed it. Let me look just make sure that this is so that you can see. Mm. Yeah, I think something happened with notability just changed something. Uh, I'm really sorry. I'm good. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the <clears throat> the <clears throat> so the uh, if I a super translation is generally given by f of f times times any. And the question is, can we, what, what is the characterization of translation? 
and the translation characterization i unfortunately i they may have some slight factors not correct but it is going to be it is something like this plus f times rho ab equal to zero so this is that does not refer to bondi frame so if you go to bondi frames and this is garoche's rho ab and if you go to bondi frame then the scalar curvature is 2 so and the garoche's rho ab is just to go to qab and therefore this is just becomes da db of f and that, that's why it's not completely right there's something this is proportional to yeah so let me just say uh hold on please. DADBF is proportional to rho uh, F times rho AB. So here it will be DADBF in the Bondi frame. It will be proportional to F times rho AB, and that is going to rho AB just equal to QAB. Yeah, this is a numerical factor that I want to check, and I, I, I've not been able to check. So, uh, and this is exactly, you know, this is the Bondi frame. So if it, uh, it says that F, DADBF F is proportional to that, so it says that db of f is a conformal keeling vector field and this is true only in the, so this is a body frame um, only if um, f is equal to either uh, y0 zero, 0 in which case uh, this proportional factor is 0 or y1m in which case proportional factor is 1 but there's a more elegant way of writing this equation where i don't have to draw or I, I don't have to say proportional to I actually can give the what the number is, and I don't remember that right now. Okay, so let me just go back and uh, lecture number four. Okay, um, okay, so we got a symmetric group B, which is a BMS group, and um, the, the fundamental dynamical field as cry is going to be, right, this really is a little awkward because everything, all the setting changed. Um, this is good. No. Okay, so I, I think I'm going to have a problem with the pointer. Um, No. Okay, maybe maybe I'll just use this one. Okay. So um as sky we've got the, the symmetry group which is B, B up here. No, no, that's not what it should be. Sorry. I'm very sorry, but I don't know what to do here. So uh Pointer just disappeared. Okay, I have to stop share and use the other device. I'll do that. So, are there Sorry any about devices this. for the speaker? Uh, I, I think I can. I can. I can use other. No, this is fine. Perfectly, perfectly fine. Uh, so, I think I should be able to do. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if this helps, but maybe you could force close the app and then reopen it again. Uh, I I could do that, but I think this is this should be okay. Full maybe close. Closer. Are there any other ideas? Okay. Can you see, you can see my screen, right? Or can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm just using laptop now. So unfortunately, the the pointer is not going to be so good, but. Uh, They just updated something right in between the two lectures. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Okay, good. Sorry that this is going to be a bit quite a bit late now. Um, so we got the symmetric group. You you see my pointer also. Do you see the pointer? Yes. Okay. So the, the fundamental dynamical field at SCRI is now the derivative operator and it captures the radiative content of space time. Though um, through its curvature, uh, it actually determines precisely the pullback of this tensor field KAB that we had talked about. And that is the same as the news and psi 4 naught, psi 3 naught, and psi 2 naught. And recall that the news was just the lead derivative of sigma naught, and sigma naught is basically coordinate, or uh, sigma naught is a way of talking about the derivative operator uh, by introducing some extra structures. So we got a tensor field rather than a derivative operator. And the news is, is therefore, the news function, if you like, is the, is the time derivative of sigma naught. And this, what we call KEB, that has information about uh, pullback of this. Uh, is, is is going to be lien of this, and therefore it is a, it is just a psi four norm. So in stationary space times, the derivative operator is trivial in the sense that it is completely determined by the metric QAB, and so we can choose this u equal to constant cross sections as I mentioned, so that sigma naught is identically equal to zero and psi four is equal to zero. But in radiative space time, d is non-trivial and new tensor is not zero, psi, and psi four naught is equal to zero. Now, using the BMS symmetries, uh, psi, the radiative phase space, we can compute the fluxes carried by gravitational waves across uh, across sky. And Hamiltonian generating the infinitesimal canonical transformations are just given by dA, just like for Maxwell field, we are a killing vector field and given any Maxwell field FAB. Lead derivative by the killing vector field of FAB is another Maxwell field. So similarly here, we have got the derivative operator and I can just, if you like, I can perform an infinitesimal diffeomorphism and drag the derivative operator along it. So if I'm op operating on some one form, then that is going to go to what, you, what it was before, plus epsilon times just lead, e, lead derivative of, of the derivative of the one form minus derivative of the lead derivative of the one form. So this is an infinitesimal motion on the phase space on the space on sky, which actually acts on the derivative operators and in this particular way. This is the same as what we did for the Maxwell field. And in Maxwell theory, the flux or the energy, for example, was, was, was uh, given by as a generator of similar canonical transformations. And so we do the same thing here. So we can ask across cry what the Hamiltonian generating this canonical transformation is. This is a canonical transformation on the radiative phase space, and we can ask for the Hamiltonian. And for translations, the namely that, uh, sorry, for, for super translations, I get the formula for the Hamiltonian, and that is new tensor multiplied by whatever function I got here for the root and new tensor, but plus I get an additional term. And this is the additional term, which is going to be absent in the case of translations, because in the case of translations, um, DADBF, as, as we just saw just a minute ago, DADBF is proportional to the metric or proportional to 
Roy B if in, in, in the case of uh, Garrosh tensor. And so it's, pro it's proportional to the metric for the case of the Bondi news and N is, is uh, trace free. And therefore this will just drop out. And therefore I would just get the first term in the case of if you've got a translation. But for super translation, I get this extra term. And this extra term is responsible for the infrared effects, infrared issues that we talked about before, that I just mentioned before. So, um, so for the, the super translation flux is just given by linear term, a term which is linear in news and term which is quadratic in news. This is often called the soft term and this is called the hard term. But this is just the terminology coming from particle physics up here. But for the super translation, uh, for translations, we just have the second, this quadratic term up here. And therefore I got just here alpha times NN. If we have got a time translation, then alpha is always positive. And therefore, uh, and in fact, in, a, in this body gauge, you can choose alpha equal to one, and that would be a pure time translation. And then the, the energy is just given by NAB and AB, and it is positive definite. So this was a big first triumph that in fact, gravitational waves carry energy, and that energy is actually positive, And that was a positive, um, and then, uh, so, and then this is the reason why Bondi had famously said that yes, gravitational waves are real. There are no ambiguities like what we talked about yesterday or the day before yesterday about the Einstein-Rosen waves and such things. There are no coordinate effects. This really is an invariant motion. And for us, this new tensor is constructed out of the curvature of the intrinsic derivative operator D on scratch. Now, that commonly used formula for gravitation in the gravitational wave literature. So here I got uh, the, the, the energy momentum is first four YLMs multiplied by NAB and AB, and the, trans, and the super, super momentum is really arbitrary function of f of theta phi, quadratic term, and then a linear term in news. Okay. Now in the gravitational wave literature, the expressions given above do not depend on coordinates or tetrads or uh, pseudo tensors. Maybe I can do even this and it becomes better or it becomes worse, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Can you see this better or is it worse? It seems to be worse. So the, the commonly used formula, expressions given about do not depend on coordinates or tetrads or pseudo tensors. At SCRI, we can unambiguously calculate the fluxes of energy momentum, and these are covariant expressions. But one often introduces coordinates, u theta phi, to make expressions more explicit, for example, for numerical relativity. And one defines the angular derivative f that acts on spin weighted scalars. As I mentioned last time, spin weighted scalars are the ones we just count how many m's you have and how many m bars you have. The here I got two m bars and therefore shear has spin weight minus two. News has spin weight two because there are two m's up here, and psi four naught has also spin weight minus two like shear because there are two m bars up here. If a, a scalar f has spin weight s then f of s is an angular derivative, just d, 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 d theta, theta and d, d, d phi with some sine theta thrown in here. And this, what if a has spin weight s, then f of a has spin weight s plus one. So it adds spin add plus one spin weight. So now I can just take this formula I got here for the fluxes and I can write it out in terms of coordinates and in terms of the tetrad components. And then I obtain that if I got a super translation, then I got a quadratic term in news and I got a linear term in news. What I did up here in going from, in going from this formula to the next formula is basically I express the news tensor up here in terms of shear and uh, so shear, time derivative of shear up here. And in the second term, I just integrated by parts so that the derivatives hit news or time derivative of shear and f is 
left outside. And so that's what we did up here. So F is left outside. I integrated by parts and the, the, space, the angular derivatives are hitting the, the, the news, which is sigma dot up here. And for the, for the translations, then the, so F is equal to alpha is a translation. Then this term disappears because, because F of F is equal to zero, like H squared of F is equal to zero. So if I integrate by parts, I will just get zero. Integration by parts doesn't create any surface terms because S2s are all compact. And then we get this. So in the literature, you will see this as the expression for super momentum and this as the expression for uh, linear momentum up here. Now the key properties here are balance laws. We got super momentum flux is, is an integral over scry, scry plus. So the thing that I wrote down before here, super momentum flux up here, is really an integral on sky plus, but it's an integral on sky plus of three form. That's every integral here is a really integral of a three form, but that three form happens to be exact. And therefore it is actually curl of a two form up here. So if you are given a sky up here, and here is some binary, which is emitting gravitational waves up here. Then if I given two cross sections, U2 and U1 up here, then the flux that I wrote down is in, 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 in between u1 and u2, between this thing. Delta sky just means between u1 and u2. It's just given by the difference between two surface charges because the flux is, a, is, is an exact three form. And therefore, it is just given by the difference between two surface charges up here. And these two surface charges are the charge integrals that I wrote down up here. And the char the, the super momentum, the charge, the charge integral is called the super momentum, it's a two surface integral. And that super momentum is just given by a real part of psi to naught. And remember this, we had seen this to be a measure of the Coulombic part of the gravitational field. In the, it is a coefficient of one upon r cube part of the wild tensor. And then I got here an additional shear term and a new term. So if the news is zero, this is equal to zero, and I just get this, and this is the formula for the energy momentum of, uh, in the case of, um, uh, in, in the in the case of stationary space time. <clears throat> but in general, there is this extra term, which is the shear times shear dot up here. And this is the interpretation of having the total energy at a retarded instant of time. So for example, I got here some energy here, Energy was carried away by gravitational waves. And what is left out at the retarded instant of time up here is this. So this is, at the moment, I'm looking at a, not energy, but I'm looking at just entire super momentum. It has infinitely many components, but the idea is the same. This is super momentum left at that instant of time, allowing for the flux of super momentum across scrum. Um, so, as I said here, this, this, the charge at C1 minus charge at C2 is a flux that is carried away. So specializing the translations, then we just get the same formula that I written down up here. And then I obtain, uh, so specializing the translations, I just get instead of, these are the first four spherical harmonics in the Bondi frame, and we just get this term up here. Now the positive energy theorems proved in the early 80s showed that this these flux integrals are in fact positive if alpha is positive like if we talk talking about energy uh, then this flux integral is positive and th and that shows that in fact this p alpha that i wrote down for each translation alpha i get a number therefore we can think of this as being a four vector which assigns to each translation a number or four, four co-vector it like assigns to each translation a number up here and these theorems say then that the energy momentum four vector is actually time-like. These theorems, of course, assume that in the interior of space-time, the matter that you may have satisfies local energy conditions. So the positivity, positivity of the body flux up here is, doesn't require any energy conditions inside. We don't care what is happening inside. Gravitational waves always carry positive energy up here. Whereas to define, to, to, to show positivity of the charge integrals that I need the, uh, the, the energy conditions to happen globally in the space time. So the positivity of the bonding charge is a global result 
that has a restriction on entire space time, whereas the positivity of the body energy is a result just at sky. <laughs> now, there is a non trivial agreement. And this agreement is that if I take this cross section, and if I actually take the limit as u goes to minus infinity, just along scra, I will get some answer for the body, uh, for the body, uh, the, the charge up here, namely this charge that I got here for the for the whatever the component of the four momentum is I got here. And this at u equal to u naught, and I can take the limit as u naught goes to minus infinity. But I can also define the ADM for momentum by completely ignoring scry and just looking at a space-like Cauchy surface, taking two surface integrals up here and evaluating some two surface quantities and taking the limit up here. And when I take the limit up here, I will get some quantity. This does not know anything about scry. This only knows about the initial data. This limits up here don't know anything about the Cauchy surface. They only know about the fields at scry. But nonetheless, it is true that the past limit of the body form momentum is equal to the ADM form momentum. And so there is a very nice con uh, consistency. The ADM form momentum here is a total energy momentum of the physical space time. It includes matter that may be inside up here as well as gravitational waves, whereas the body form momentum is a total form momentum left over for allowing the form momentum flux across cry in this little region up here. <clears throat> and gravitational and electromagnetic waves carry away positive energy, but the remaining energy that is left over, if they carry positive energy, but it could happen that they carry away more energy than there was in the system, and then there will be instability, but that is not the case because we know that the body form momentum up here or the body energy up here is again positive. So the energy that is carried away cannot exceed the total energy. So it's a very nice physical result. And it's a beautiful interplay between geometry and physics that we have got. I, I, to me, it is a, one of the deepest interplays that I've seen between geometry and physics. Because this, this positive, positive, positivity of the mass up here and positivity of the mass up here really are purely different geometrical results in some ways. Of course, they use Einstein's. They use energy conditions. So in that case, in that sense, they know about general relativity. But you could just think of them as purely differential geometric results. And they actually agree with our physical intuition. It's a very, 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 very positive thing. So the last part that I'm going to talk about, um, it has to do with the balanced laws as diagnostic tools for waveforms. So what we are seeing in the first part is conceptual and mathematical structures associated with gravitational waves in full nonlinear general relativity. Thus, what we saw was that in order to define radiation, we had to go to infinity, a scry. Going to infinity along null rays is really a nice way of getting to scry, a nice way of defining radiation. And then we could, we, we could define the asymptotic symmetries and as, with associated with asymptotic symmetries, there is a four momentum, and super momentum. There's also angular momentum, but as I mentioned in the last lecture, uh, to talk about angular momentum, I would need much more uh, machinery, and it would have required an additional lecture, which I don't have. So I'm going to just focus on energy momentum and angular momentum. So this is what is, and this machinery was available already in the 80s. <laughs> um, the papers that I mentioned about the equality of, you know, of positive, uh, of the, uh, the this was already uh, available in the late 70s and all the other formulae about connection and the radiative phase space and so on were available already in the 80s but the main point is really the what the, the this lectures complement the lectures on approximation methods for example what you saw in the lectures on post newtonian approximation that piotr talked about yesterday um now, in, in this approximation methods, for example, in the post-Newtonian case, in order to speak of um, transverse traceless degrees of freedom, <clears throat> one had to, as he emphasized many, many times, one had to have take inverses of the Lambertians, and these were non-local operators. So HTT was an extremely non-local operator in his framework, 
because he's working in the full space time. So he is working in this full space time up here. And to define HTT here is a very non-local operation. It's a very beautiful and counterintuitive fact. It's not something that you would expect immediately that when you go to scry, these quantities become local at scry. There's nothing non-local about the derivative, about the radiative degrees of freedom at scry. I'm just defining them in terms of the derivative operator. The bondy news is defined up here and so on and so forth. And the psi 4 naught is defined up here. Radiation field is defined up here. All these things just become, I don't have to invert any, uh, any operator, it, uh, any differential operator. It is really locally defined up here. So that is a really a big difference. And part two, what we want to see is how results in exact general relativity can be used as diagnostic tools to test the accuracy of waveform models. Now, normally, one uses numerical simulations to evaluate accuracy, but there are regions in the parameter space where numerical simulations are sparse. The diagnostic tests come from identities that must be satisfied in exact general relativity. You see, what one has is all these approximate waveforms, and one would like to know how accurate they are. Now, if we had the exact waveform, we could just compare it with the approximate one and say how accurate it is. But of course, we don't have an exact waveform. And therefore, we need some diagnostic tool. And the beauty of this method is that we can test how well a waveform is doing without knowing the exact waveform. You give me a candidate waveform, and I know that if it were really faithful to full general relativity, then it should satisfy some identities. And therefore, and these are the balance laws. And therefore, if the, this is to satisfy the identities, these balance laws, which we just discussed up here, these balance laws that I, I was talking about up here, namely the, the, the super momentum on a cross section, um, super momentum this cross section minus super momentum on this cross section is equal to the moment, whatever was rate, super momentum that has radiated away. This is an exact statement. So if you give me a particular wafer model, I can calculate these quantities and I can check if in fact the, the, the balanced law is satisfied. And that is, what, uh, that is what has been done in the last three or four years. And, the, and, and that is actually suggested improvements of uh, the, the directions for improvements in all regions of the parameter space. Um, and furthermore, the balanced laws can be used to test accuracy of the numerical waveforms themselves. So in the last two lectures, I was going to talk about, uh, to tell you more details about these uh, waveforms. For me, it took really a long time, you know, like a year or so to understand the literature uh, that, that people are using in order to come to some global understanding that I can share with both mathematically minded people and the waveform people so as to set a bridge between the, math the math 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 mathematical structures and the waveforms. Okay, so I think I would just like to know something completely frankly from all of you. Namely, is it worth my giving the talks tomorrow? Because tomorrow there is nothing I just noticed between, uh, uh, between the morning talks and the three o'clock talks. Uh, if people want to just not have these talks, I can just send you, in any case, I will send you my lectures and then I don't have to give the talks tomorrow. You can read the lectures and we can just spend a little more time today in discussion and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can just read about the part two in the, in the lectures, in the lecture notes that I have given you. Because it seems to me that if there are only very few people who are going to be left tomorrow uh, for the, and they have to wait, you know, two or three hours, for these lectures, maybe it is not worth it. So Yurek, please don't be polite. Just tell me what would be better. I'm happy to just stay here for a few minutes. And, and anyway, it's, we've got 15 more minutes and lead some discussions. And then we can end the set, my, my talks right now today. Or if there is interest in following about these waveform models, then we can, we can discuss that as well. So please let me know what you think we should be doing. Uh, okay, so I can be impolite in any any form you want. However, I would prefer to to have lectures tomorrow. So um, I, I know what, what about audience. Audience, who, who is going to uh, come 
tomorrow to see the lecturers. Yeah, Abai, so if you can take a look in your... It seems to me that there are only one person that are raising their hands, right? <laughs> Two. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that, yeah. Yeah, three. let us have lectures according to the plan. Are you sure? Because, I mean, just three people is not worth it, right? But almost all people. No, no, but almost everybody raised hands. I, I think oh, almost everybody raised hands. Everybody raised, raised hands, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, then, then we can have the lectures. I mean, I, I'm happy to have the lectures and I can also happy to have the discussion. What I'm going to do right now is, in the meanwhile, you can ask me questions. What I'm going to do is to follow the advice and see if I can uh, reboot uh, uh, this notability because then I can write and I can answer but I can also orally answer the question. There are several questions that I wanted to address. Something have to do with the, you know, uh, people, somebody asked me, maybe Adam or somebody asked me about, uh, yeah, about the cosmological constant. So I will want to answer that question now. And also there was a question about, uh, or issues about peeling. It is very confusing in the literature. There are statements which are said in opposite directions about reasonable, reasonableness of peeling. And I would like to discuss that. So, but I, I would like to, you know, open the floor and ask for any questions that people may have. <clears throat> okay, so are there more questions? Uh, yes, so uh, first of all, thanks for your lectures. I'm really enjoying them. Um, my question is um, actually in a similar spirit than uh, Jazzy's question in the last session um, on other asymptotic symmetry groups and uh, in particular the Newman-Unti group. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, my, my question is, can you maybe sketch the physical difference between the BMS group and the Newman-Unti group? So there is this um, article of uh, Schmidt, Sommers and Walker, and like from a mathematical perspective, the difference is that the, the Newman-Unti group is the, well, they showed that it's the automorphism group of Scry, whereas the BMS group is uh, a subgroup thereof that uh, preserves um, Penrose's conformal structure, which is a two, two tensor on the, uh, on the boundary. So maybe, um, yeah, you can give some intuition what the, the physical motivation would be to, to uh, consider one or the other. Thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. So, so, I mean, uh, thank you for <laughs> for jog jogging my memory because I had forgotten the the difference, and so as soon as you said it, it came back to me. So that's very good. Um, so let me just say, uh, I, I really wish I could write, but I okay. So let let me just give you the answer orally, and then if it is still not clear, I'll try to see if I can write. So the the. The Penrose tensor, the four, the tensor that they talk about is really just given by what I call QAB times, so QAB is downstairs indices, AB times NC and D, NC and D upstairs indices. And this tensor is invariant uh, because QAB goes to omega squared QAB and A goes to omega to the minus one NA and therefore QAB downstairs, NA upstairs and B upstairs. So QAB downstairs and C upstairs and D up upstairs, that is conformally invariant, and that is what we people use. So my answer to your question is really the same as, as before, but as uh, you, you hear this question. I mean, what I would like to understand is really, um, is there anything that we are missing in, uh, in um, uh, are, are there physical systems that we are missing by restricting ourselves to the BMS versus the Newman and Tiglo? And I don't see that there are any systems missing. I mean, I've had innumerable conversations with uh, Newman, um, and he, in the at least until the very recent years, he was completely happy with the BMS group. So uh, personally, I don't see any anything that is really we're missing if we restrict ourselves to BMS group. Let me again emphasize: if I look at uh, some um, some any theory really, and if I say look at the asymptotic conditions of that theory, the weaker the asymptotic conditions, larger is going to be the symmetry group which preserves that. So Newman anti group would be larger; it would preserve. Uh, therefore, it, it, the, the the boundary conditions it is giving you are weaker, and I don't see anything 
that is physically interesting that Newman anti boundary conditions would actually ad accommodate, which is ruled out by the BMS group. As you rightly said, BMS group is, is in some ways tied to Scry, uh, tied to the Penrose's construction from Scry, but it's also, in fact, historically obtained before the conformal completion by Bondi and, and then by Sachs completely. And so I think that uh, that's also obtained uh, using the physical space times. It can also be obtained using the physical space time picture. You don't have to necessarily look at sky. To me, looking at sky makes it cleaner. Have I answered the question? Or... Sorry, Do you have... I took the microphone. Uh, yes, uh, actually you did. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to... to um... Um, add that this is also nice from maybe a mathematical point of view because uh, we have shown that the Newman Unti group, um, the full Newman Unti group, cannot be made an infinite dimensional Lie group. So only uh, the subgroup that is connected to the uh, identity can be made uh, an infinite dimensional Lie group, whereas the BMS group can. So it's, um, yeah, nice from yeah, mathematical I did not know that. Thank you for sharing that with me. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask a basic question. Like when we talk about the Scry Plus, so yeah. if if let's say far away from this uh, LIGO Virgo Lisa detector, if these binaries are colliding, so when we we detect them on Earth, that is the can that be considered as Scry Plus or this is uh, like how is it? And why I'm asking this is because if we are at Scry Plus and detecting the gravitational waves, so the let's say the memory part which we detect is due to the translation charges or the super translation charges? Like the displacement memory or the some memory if we detect. Yeah. Good. So there are two questions. The first is about, uh, about detector is on Earth. We are not at infinite distance. And so, you know, yeah. So the statement is that in physics, we always make this idealization of going to infinity. When we mean we go to distances which are very large. What does large mean? It means large compared to the wavelength of the radiation. So for example, in the very first lecture, I was telling you that, well, to really talk about radiation, we need to go to scrap, even for electromagnetic theory. But you know, radio has been working for, <laughs> for more than you know, a century and a half. And so how uh, and you know people did not know anything about infinity or sky or anything like that, and so the pain point there is exactly the same, namely that if you want to have precise mathematical formulae, uh, you know this is an idealization that we do, uh, but in practice it means that you are at a distance which is very very large compared to the wavelengths that you are considering, and the wavelengths that we are receiving at LIGO, but even even the wavelengths that we'll be seeing with LISA, uh, LISA are very large. But that state, statement is that uh, those wavelengths are still uh, 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 small compared to the distance between us and the source. And that is a good idealization. A much more familiar example is just given by quantum mechanics. You know, all your colleagues, for example, do tabletop experiments with neutron scattering and so on and so forth. They use non relatives to quantum mechanics in condensed matter physics. And what one is doing is using scattering theory. And in the scattering theory, again, in non relativistic quantum mechanics, you go from minus infinity time to plus infinity time. And uh, that is uh, idealization in the real lab. Of course, you're not going to infinity. Uh, you're not waiting infinity. You're not going to infinite distances either. It's just that you're going at very large distances compared to the, the, the target that, that, that you've got up here size of the target, and we are waiting long enough compared to the time scales of the processes that we're talking about. So that is the first answer. The second question was about, um, about uh, memory. And the statement is that memory really has to do with exactly this soft part that I talked about, namely of the... So here, as, as we said, let me give both the, uh, both the slides. So as we say here, I got super momentum and super momentum is a term which is quadratic and term which is linear. And the memory has to do with this linear term. And this linear term disappears here. The linear term disappears here because 
um, uh, in, for translations, it disappears because DADB alpha translation, say in the body frame, is proportional to the metric and that hits NAB. NAB is stress free. This is proportional to the metric, so I get zero. And that is why for translations, you just have this term. So translations, energy momentum, or has no notion. Uh, you, you, you can't tell anything about memory from energy momentum. You really need super translation to talk about memory. In terms of in terms of this, more perhaps the, these expressions which you might be more familiar with, the energy momentum has just to do with this sigma dot squared integral, whereas memory has to do with with um, with this integral, with the integral of the second quantity that we talked about here. It has to do with the uh, uh, yeah. If, if in fact the along each generator of scry, so forget about this d2s for a minute. Just look at d2u. Along each generator of scry, you can integrate that quantity out and you will get some, um, it's a, you don't have to, let me start, let me start from scratch. You don't have to do what I'm saying. I already have f of theta and phi. What this f of theta and phi does is basically extract from here the angular dependence because f is arbitrary. So this integrating with f of theta and phi is just un, trying to understand what the angular moment, angular dependence of this is. So if you forget about f of theta and phi, and you forget about the integral on d2s, then what you're doing up here is just d 2 u. So you're integrating from u equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, this quantity. And the theta phi dependence of that integral between minus infinity to infinity is the memory. Yeah, I'm sorry that I, I wish my tablet I was working. And by writing this formula, it would be much easier. But I hope I communicated and I answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Oh, there's not... No more questions. Okay. So then let me just answer the question that was asked some time ago very quickly. Uh, I, uh, actually, I have, I have a question. Sorry, I was not please. able to turn on the microphone. So um, you didn't discuss uh, angular momentum. Right. It seems that angular momentum is much more, <clears throat> much more difficult than the, the energy and, and momentum, right? It's, it's more difficult because only in the sense that uh, it's not difficult. I mean, I, I really feel so bad about uh, uh, not being able to share the things. If, if the formula, maybe next time I'll do it. I'll, 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 I'll explain next time in the beginning of the next time. The formula for the flux of angular momentum and the formula for the flux of mm -hmm. super momentum, they look exactly the same. Uh, it is just lead, lead derivative is, you know, what I, what I was saying here, right? It is, um, it is, it is really it looks like NAB times, okay, good, here I got. So what, what matters is this, this quantity, lead C of D minus D of lead C. And as I mentioned before, D is non-trivial only on L, such that L dot N is equal to minus one. If K is a horizontal one form, then, then D action is universal. So the non-triviality is only on L. And so the formula for energy for the super momentum, what I wrote, wrote down here, really is just NAB times lead C, where C is this of DA LB minus DA lead C of LB. Okay, so this form, this part up here, I can just put this here. I can just put this thing here with K replaced by L, and that would be the formula. And for angular momentum, it is exactly the same NAB times lead C. But now C is the generator of the angular momentum. So the formula is the same in that sense. What is non-trivial is really that to get the charge integral, so this part is a non-trivial part in some ways. The charge integral, I told you that the flux was, uh, yeah, that the flux is actually a exact three form, exact two form, and therefore I can write it as a charges. So going from the flux to the charges is more non-trivial. And it is non-trivial because it involves uh, this psi one, which is really like the part of the asymptotic wild tensor, the charge involves part of the asymptotic wild tensor, which is not easily, uh, it's not so easy to write in terms of quantities which are intrinsic to scry. You have to write it 
you, you need to have sky embedded in the full space time. So it's, it's, it's not that difficult, but it's, it's just slightly, slightly more difficult. Actually. So technically there's no problem, but conceptually the statement is that in order to make, in order to make sense of the four momentum, uh, four momentum is exactly like what it was for, uh, four momentum is exactly like, like what it is for Maxwell theory. It's like in Minkowski space, you know, there's no, but, Angular momentum is not like what is in Minkowski space because angular momentum in Minkowski space only has a ambiguity of translations, which I said corresponds to looking at the origin about which the angular momentum is being defined. And this ambiguity is there even for the uh, in, in Newtonian gravity. But for super translation, the ambiguity is infinite dimensional. It really involves the super translation, which is the arbitrary function of f and theta and phi. That is what is more complicated. But I think I some of the references I've given you do talk about angular momentum. In particular, there is one paper which is called The Subtle Issue of Angular Momentum, and uh, uh, which, which is relatively recent in the last couple of years. Uh, so that might be a good reference for students and everybody to look at angular momentum. Did you have anything specific about angular momentum that you, you wanted to ask? Yes, so mathematicians make efforts to define ah. unique angular momentum. So what, what do you, are you familiar with those works? Yeah, yeah. So they want to remove the super translation ambiguity, but their notion of concert quantity is very different. They start with, they start with some quasi-local definition inside space-time, and they want to take the limit up here. They don't make a direct, for these definitions of angular momentum and linear momentum and super momentum, as you can see everywhere, the it's a linear mapping. Uh, I hope, yeah. For example, super mom, super momentum is a linear mapping from the space of super translations into real numbers. In the simplistic geometry case, it is really a momentum map in the sense that it's a linear mapping from the generators of symmetries into into numbers, and the numbers are provided by the field that you got here. So it is, it, this is the same thing for the stress energy tensor of the Maxwell field, right? Um, if I look at the Maxwell field, um, you give me a killing vector field, and you give me a, a solution, then I get TAB, I get a number. So it's a linear map from the space of symmetries into numbers. So similarly here, the super momentum is a linear map from the space of super translations into numbers where the linear map is provided by the physical field that we're talking about up here. But the, the formulae which come from interior of space time and go to, I mean, define some quasi-local quantity. They take these two sphere, they embed it in Minkowski space time in some way. Um, and then they calculate something in Minkowski space time. And then they take the limit to, to scry up here. That really, breaks all the reference, all the relation between the momentum map no, in, interpretation up here. So what they are talking about is not a linear mapping from the space of generators of the BMS group into, <clears throat> into real numbers. It's a different notion of angular momentum. It's, it's a different notion of, uh, it's a different notion of momentum and angular momentum. Mm. Oh, I see, thank you. So, so there's no, it's not, it's not, it's not a linear mapping because if you had a linear mapping from the space of BMA generators into numbers, then if the two generators differ by super translation, so two generators of angular momentum, so you choose two Lorentz subgroups which differ by super translation, then the difference must be super translation. And therefore, if I take the linear map, then the difference must be a super momentum. So this is a super momentum ambiguity is not something that is dreamed of. It just follows from the fact that it is a momentum map. Any momentum map will have a super, super translation ambiguity. So to, to get rid of the ambiguity, you want to sacrifice the idea that these are momentum mappings. They are linear mappings from space of all, the, from the generators of the Lie group into, or into, the, into, the, into real numbers. Thank you. Are there more questions? 
Okay, so it seems there are no no more questions. So, so, so shall I take a couple of minutes to talk about the positive lambda? It's not going to be long, yes. or are we can. Yes, please. Okay, because this question was asked a while ago about what what happens if lambda is not equal to zero, and uh, and the statement is that the situation is very complicated, and in fact, even as as we stand up here, uh, we really don't have a good notion of body energy, or you know, new body news. Um, or radiation field and so on and so forth. So what happens basically is the following, that in the case when, uh, in, in, in the case when we got uh, sky is null, as I spent some time in explaining, uh, we have the metric on sky is degenerate. <clears throat> Sorry, just one second. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> the metric on sky is degenerate and therefore we get a derivative operator, but this derivative operator is not directly determined by the metric itself. And the beauty is that the freedom in the choice of the derivative operator exactly encodes the two radiative degrees of freedom of, of, the, of the gravitational field. So the, whatever the radiative modes are, if the full nonlinear gravitational field, they are captured here, because D is not unique. D is not completely determined by QAB. QAB is universal, but DA is not determined by Q QAB. Now, if in fact you've got a positive lambda, then you've got, uh, you, you got positive lambda, then, <clears throat> um, um, then QAB, uh, the sky is actually uh, space-like, and therefore QAB is, is non-degenerate. And therefore, of course, if QAB is non-degenerate, then the D on sky that is imposed, that is induced by the space-time D, space-time ground up here, is exactly the one which is determined by the plus 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 signature metric at sky up here. So that means that I cannot use D to encode my radiative degrees of freedom. And therefore, the radiative degrees of freedom are encoded in Q itself. Right? Because D has, if you know Q, then D is determined. So I don't have that extra tool, extra handle in which to put in the radiative degrees of freedom. So the radiative degrees of freedom are already in the metric it, itself. Appear. Now here we had this very clean separation, which was very, very nice. Namely, we had um, we had uh, sorry, just one second. We had a Clean separation, we got, uh, maybe it's afterwards, yeah. Namely, we got, um, yeah, yeah, it is. We got a clean separation, namely at Scry, we got a universal structure, which is the metric QAB and the null normal NA, or this fourth order, fourth rank tensor of Penrose's, which is QAB and C and D. That's what we're gonna describe here. Um, and that is universal. It doesn't really depend on which space time you're talking about. But now even the metric at SCRA, intrinsic metric at SCRA, depends on which space time you have got. And therefore I don't have a universal metric at SCRA. And therefore the group of symmetry is just, is just infinite dimensional diffeomorphism group of SCRA. There's no structure which is universal that I can take out. And that, that means that, you know, I really, don't have the analog of the BMS group. If I try to put extra structure on Scry, and there is some natural structure you can you can put on Scry um, to reduce the group. In fact, something beautiful does happen both in the anti-Dissiter case and the Dissiter case. Namely, in the two cases, the group of diffeomorphisms can be reduced to just the group of uh, the Dissiter or the anti-Dissiter group, ten-dimensional group. It's like the Poincaré group, if you like. Uh, in the two cases. And so that is very beautiful. But unfortunately, that extra boundary condition you choose in the beginning might seem harmless to you, but it's very harmful because it ru rules out all radiation. In other words, if you put this extra condition, then you do have causal quantities, just like, like the charges that I talked about. And you can calculate the fluxes, but all the fluxes are zero. So there's no energy or momentum or angular momentum carried by any 
by by gravitational waves or electromagnetic waves in that case. Uh, sorry, by gravitational waves in that case. And so that is what is very difficult. And finally, if I don't put that condition, extra condition, so that there are gravitational waves and there and so on, electromagnetic waves there, then because cry is space-like, so sky is space-like like that, like this line up here, therefore, if I got any killing vector field, or if I got any asymptotic symmetry vector fields, they all have to be tangential to scry. So they are space-like. See, in, in the null case, in the case when we got null here, then I got time translation, which is a null vector field, a future-directed null vector field. And it is future-directed because if it's a time translation, then that function um, alpha is positive. So it's a future-directed null, null vector field. And then I get a positive energy. Uh, for example, for Maxwell field, we could get positive energy because I got stress energy tensor dotted with a null vector field. But if sky is space-like, if sky is like that, space-like up here, then the all the symmetry vector fields are space-like. Therefore, if I take the Maxwell field TAB and I plugged it into it, any symmetry vector field, symmetry vector field is space-like, and therefore the quantity I will obtain is like a momentum, if you like. It has no definite sign. It can be positive or negative. And so it's a long, you know, you have to sort of, sort of potentially electromagnetic, there are electromagnetic waves which carry arbitrarily amount of negative energy. So similarly, there will be gravitational waves which could carry arbitrary amount of negative energy. And so the question is really, how do we, um, but it's to show that in fact, such negative energy solutions cannot be actually produced. You can show this in the linearized approximation that the, such negative energy solutions cannot be produced in with, with gravitational case using the quadruple generalization of the quadruple moment formula. But in the full relativity, there is a danger. It's a very global issue about even showing positivity of energy. In the in the in the um, in the null case, we just saw here very very simply that because you have got um, um, uh, you got null sky, we we can see here explicitly that energy that is carried away is actually positive. Or in the case of, it is really nu squared, uh, that is the energy that is carried away and that is positive. But in the case of um, space-like cry, uh, we really cannot do that. So that that is these are the difficulties. I hope I've given you at least a general feel for why it is so difficult. Um, I, for me, it was very surprising that it is so difficult. Okay, so any comments? Co Questions? If not, we can stop. Yes, yes. Now there are co new, new comments. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, I I I completely agree. Um, in in the sense that we don't have something like an energy moment for the gravitational uh, field with a positive cosmological constant, but uh, we do have. A uh, geometric covariant and gauge invariant condition for the presence of gravitational radiation at infinity with a positive cosmological constant. And so this is based on the Bell Robinson tensor and works equally well with a vanishing cosmological constant and with a positive cosmological constant. And indeed, one since you were talking about this uh, magnetic part of the of the Bell tensor, indeed one can, one can write it as the commutator between the electric and magnetic parts of the rescale Bell tensor and infinity. Um, just to point out this, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So I think that's a very nice work. I think you know it is done. I don't, you probably did it, but it's also, I, the, where I've seen, seen it was some papers of Sinovella. Um, but you know the Bell Robinson tensor doesn't have the dimension of energy. Uh, uh, I mean, when, yeah, I agree. So I'm not talking about energy. I'm, I'm talking about a condition that tells you when gravitational radiation arrives at the sky. I'm I'm not talking about symmetry. Yeah, but I don't know why. I mean. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a weaker form of what we would like, right? I mean, we would like to know, for example, we would like to know uh, in this gravity, in this LIGO things, right? I mean, I would like to have a waveform. Yeah, I don't have a lot of the waveform. Let Let me put it in the following. So in the following way. So uh, how would we, how would how would one um, aim at finding some energy momentum for the gravitational field 
without knowing, without having even a, a condition telling you when gravitational radiation is present or not. So because well, it's a statically flat case, one had this this new tensor, right? Uh, or the news function uh, telling you. No, what... I, I agree. I agree. I, I, I'm just saying that, that that is that is good to know this that there's there is certain criterion uh, to say that, and, and I agree that that criterion you can use you know at, at, at null infinity and uh, at, at, at lambda equal to zero case. I agree with that completely, and that that, that would say that there is news or there's no news. Uh, my only point is that. That's good to have that criterion, but we're still very far from, you know, having a complete understanding. I mean, I would not know how to interpret I agree. the 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 waveforms and so on and so forth. So yeah, so I think we're in agreement. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see you then tomorrow and. Uh, uh, Abai, there is a formal question. So uh, we 